So, I'm sorry, but I feel it's a travesty. And uh, I recently um, received a letter from Watson Lake begging, begging to have a child center. We've really got to think about priorities. And I know we don't want to centralize everything in Whitehorse. We don't want to make everybody come to Whitehorse, et cetera, et cetera. But health care is a very... I mean, I'm, I'm not a health care person, but you know, I'm getting older. I'm using more of it. Um, and we need the specialists, and we need the skill sets that can be developed in a larger system. And, you know, I know people, they'd love to have a bridge in Dawson. Yeah, right. We can't afford it. We need to take care of business. Somebody mentioned earlier about foreign aid, and I certainly agreed with Senator Siegel's uh, comments about that. But let's get real about what we need, what we can afford, and stop thinking, I don't know what we're thinking. But I have to say, this particular policy of whoever, um, and I don't know if they're here at social inclusion, I hope so, because join me, I would love to start a movement to start thinking about let's get real and deal with the priorities. Okay, the other priority, of course, that everyone has mentioned is housing, 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 and housing. Now, um, I want to make the distinction between affordable housing that we read a lot about and need, no question. Sharon talked about her rent going up three times in four years, no question. And then there's housing geared to income, the very different thing. We hear a lot more about the affordable housing, I think, at least in the newspapers. And, <coughs> and that's because, I think, uh, we're getting federal money for some of that. Now, both are needed. I'm not an expert on it, so um, I won't say I'm not an expert on anything, actually. But I want to just talk about the geared to income. Now, I have to say, in my naivety, what do I know? I thought that seniors' housing was geared to income. I thought it was for low-income seniors. Uh, well, not necessarily. So, uh, I think we have to look at things like that. I don't think the taxpayer should be subsidizing someone who can afford a rent on the private market. That's the private sector's job. I'm not suggesting we turf anybody out. I'm just saying, let's think about that a little bit. Because there's a limited amount. I mean, there are people here today from Yukon Housing, and I appreciate that because they've heard the housing message, and I'm sure they've heard it every day in the office. And they deal with a lot of stress about this. I just know they do. I mean, they get people coming in crying. I am sure, Tricia and Dale, they get people saying, get it's a house, and there isn't any. I mean, you can't make houses that aren't there. So my comment is not... Slam Yukon housing. But again, if I just sort of follow the news, maybe every other week I hear yet another program that Yukon housing is going to be responsible for. And I'm thinking, boy, I hope they're giving them 20 staff, Dale. Is, uh, do you get more staff every time you get a new program? And It's all great, and I'm really pleased that we're getting new programs. But as everyone has said here today, <coughs> it doesn't matter how good your counseling is doesn't matter how good your program is. If the person doesn't have a place to live, as Brooke said so uh, eloquently, the person doesn't have a place to live, it really doesn't matter. And a safe, secure place for many people who are vulnerable. So, I'm not telling you anything you don't know because you've all talked about it today. And I don't think I'm telling you anything that Yukon Housing doesn't know. I would suspect. So what do we do? Well, I'd like to suggest that what we need to do, because this is such an urgent issue, and it's a now, and I can't wait for another conference, is that, I guess it would be the government, but it goes along the line of the coordination, that we establish a body, I don't know what they're called, doesn't matter, that is dedicated to working with mental health, uh, disabilities, FAS, whatever, all of the 
more vulnerable groups, uh, strictly on low income and geared to income housing. Um, and again, as I say, it's not a criticism of the current Yukon housing, but I think this is such an urgent issue, we need to specialize and to coordinate uh, the services to meet the needs. So one would work with clients. I know it involves money here, money there, whatever. But I really hope that people will think about that. And I guess this would be a government initiative to establish a body that works with all of the agencies and clients to really focus only on uh, geared to income housing. I'm not saying it's not done now, but I, I, if I were working there and I had all these other things coming at me, I'd find it pretty hard to make that a priority or as a higher priority as we have all said it should be. So that would be my suggestion. We've got the ability to redirect funds to current needs and long-term needs as well. I mentioned the, uh, in my view, ill-fated hospitals, which we hope won't be there. And, uh, you know, th there's other small things. The rates at community, uh, continuing care facilities are pretty unrealistically low. Uh, and again, not suggesting we turf anybody out, but we should look at things like that. And nobody likes to touch those things because, they, oh, you know, seniors. Well, you know, we might all be there someday, so. Um, I'd like to just uh, mention one other thing, and that is um, how we get around, if we do, jurisdictional turf wars. It seems to me this is a big issue, not just with First Nations and non-First Nations, uh, but with department, uh, sometimes with NGOs. Because the way the funding comes, you know, I got my funding for my program, and it's, it's very hard to do. And I understand that, and I think a lot of this is a great failure uh, of federal governments looking at the bigger picture in how things can be done while being accountable, but looking at the bigger picture. So could we think about doing something like whole community budgeting? I don't know, something like that. Where we really look at um, combining some of our budgets. I talked to Eris, Eric earlier and said, um, you know, I, I think since I've been here, there's always been a bit of a divide between First Nations and non-First Nations. But we used to sit down and chat a lot more than I think we do now. I think we need to sit down and chat. And I'm not just talking at the administrative level, the leadership level, but at the community level. And it, wrong, and others here could correct me, but I think it used to happen a lot more. Uh, you know, when the transition home was started, Keyushi's place, that was, uh, because I happened to do a research study on it, that was the first transition home in Canada that had a First Nations and non-First Nations board. I mean, we've done some really neat things, and we used to talk to each other. And I, maybe it's happening, and nobody invited me, which is possible. Um, but I, don't, I just don't see it happening in the same way. Uh, I think people work very hard and they talk at, um, at the higher levels. But maybe we all have to look at how we could just uh, talk to our neighbors sometimes. Um, finally, uh, I, let's deal with our own issues. And I think, I think somebody, I can't remember now because we had so many good speakers talked about this. We've got to look at ourselves. First of all, cynicism. Now, I'm the queen of cynicism. And um, I know there's lots of cynicism about government, politicians, and sometimes we give you tons of ammunition. But it's not helping anybody. It's not getting anywhere. Because, oh, politicians. Well, you know, they came together to talk about social inclusion. Even Hugh and I in a snowy day in April could agree on a number of things. 